Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Wednesday, October 31st, 2018. And happy Halloween. I am Dave Biddle. He is Steve Hellwagon. Um, Steve, the first college football playoff rankings of the season were released last night. Ohio State is merely 10th. When we were at interviews last night, word came down, and we saw Kentucky was ranked ahead of Ohio State. Your reaction really summed it up. They have Kentucky over them? Oh, my gosh. Um, that, that pretty much summed up the reaction of everybody. Like You're not used to seeing Kentucky ranked ahead of Ohio State, but you look at it on paper, right now it's deserved, I think. Um, just your, your general thoughts on Ohio State being ranked 10th in the CFP right now, Steve. Well, it's just a starting point, I guess, and um, teams have been ranked um, – that low or lower and still got into the top four at the end. I, you may, Ohio State may have been 14th, I think, in the first rankings in 2014 yep. and still uh, within a month or five weeks, six weeks, whatever it was, was able to vault up into the top four. But that team also played well down the stretch. Uh, this Ohio State team to date, 7-1, and one, and really only one win that they can hang their hat on, and that's over Penn State. Uh, we talked about it last night. Everybody else they've played is at 500 or worse, um, you know. So I think you you look at it and you just say uh, the biggest thing for Ohio State is to uh, come out on Saturday against Nebraska and show the areas where they've made improvement. And I think that's that's probably the biggest thing surrounding Ohio State right now and not really worrying too much about the end result and what the playoff rankings are and, um, you know, what the postseason destination is going to be for this team because, you know, very honestly, they're not one of the top four teams right now, uh, very on, obviously. And um, yet, as, you know, poorly as they've played at various times in the year, they're in position to steal it if they can – uh, find a way uh, to play uh, better football, play their best football down the stretch. Uh, we've seen Urban Meyer teams in the past lose a midseason game and then go on a rampage. Last year's the only time that they had a second regular season loss during his tenure. So uh, the Iowa game, obviously, after losing earlier in the season to Oklahoma. So I think people are interested this Saturday to see how they come out against Nebraska and if they show that kind of improvement. And I think if they are able to do that, then these rankings will take on more and more meaning for Ohio State in successive weeks. But if they come out and and just kind of slop around and win the game 35-28 or something like that, then I think people will you know, continue to downrate Ohio State and realize that, yeah, they have one loss, but they don't deserve to be considered among the top. So are you optimistic that this team can get their stuff together and win the Big Ten title, run the table, and win the Big Ten title? Or do you think, if you had to bet, do you think they have another loss coming down the stretch here? Well, it's certainly possible. I'm not sure Michigan State has the horses to do it. Uh, I think Michigan State is is a decent enough middle-of-the-road team for them to have won at Penn State, just as Ohio State did, kind of stealing one or pulling it out at the last second gives them some bit of credibility. Uh, they did not, coaching me early in the morning, Dave, they did not play very well against Michigan, obviously. Uh, you know, that score I don't even think was indicative of how much Michigan dominated that game. So, And that's kind of a foreboding thing for Ohio State down the line. The one saving grace about that is Ohio State plays Michigan in Ohio Stadium, where Ohio State typically has been a very strong team under Urban Meyer. So, you know, I think that uh, get through this game and show improvement. Show me that the two weeks was spent doing things to improve your scheme, improve your personnel, improve your fundamentals with your tackling, your blocking on offense, your tackling on defense. Show me that uh, you've made the proper uh, corrections and uh, maybe you'd feel better about the stretch run. I think the game at Michigan State is kind of looming out there, but at the same time, you know, I think a lot of it is less to do with the opponents. I mean, I don't see, you know, an Alabama or, you know, whoever, you know, let's just say, I mean, I guess Michigan's a national top six team at this point, but 
I don't see a dominant, dominant team out there that, that Ohio State can't beat in the next four or even five games if they make it uh, to Indianapolis. So uh, it, the cards are all out there the, on the table, and now Ohio State uh, has got to go through this schedule and, and, and show itself to be what everybody thought it could be at the beginning of the season. So other than Sean Wade perhaps starting at safety, it sounds like Sean Wade's going to move into a starting safety role. They, they haven't confirmed that, but we keep hearing rumblings that Sean Wade's going to be a starting safety over Isaiah Pryor. Pryor's, Pryor is still going to – they're not giving up on Isaiah Pryor. He's still going to be the number three safety if he loses a starting job. But um, but let's say Wade does start over Pryor. That is the only personnel change it sounds like they're going to make as far as any starters. Um I guess that, I don't know if I'm surprised about that or not. To me, I guess that's a mild surprise. As how I, I thought there might be a shakeup on the offensive line. Shakeup might be too strong. I thought there might be like one, you know, guy lose his job. I thought maybe they might bench Demetrius Knox or somebody else that they thought was underperforming and maybe get Brady Taylor in there at center or Josh Myers. Obviously, they don't think those guys are ready. Taylor's not healthy. Myers obviously isn't ready in their eyes um, to be the starting center. I was hoping Mike Jordan could get moved back to. Guard. I really feel like he's better at guard than center, and he's playing center just out of necessity. Um, you know, are you surprised? And we, again, we don't even know for sure if, if Wade is going to be, you know, moving into the starting role. But if you know, if he is, are you surprised? That's the only guy that's uh, going to be a new starter. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose so. I, you know, I'm kind of of a mind on the offensive line that uh, great. You would make a change, but does it make the offensive line better? I think that is a uh, a big debate. I think, um, as you kind of heard uh, Coach Meyer say, that uh, Brady Taylor and Brandon Bowen are just now starting to practice full go. They were hoping to get them out there yesterday and see what they could do. Uh, that, to me, does not sound like they're ready to go in on Saturday and play 40 or 50 plays even. So um, I have a hard time wondering about that. And with the whole discussion about uh, uh, Jordan at center came up, he said that that was done to get their best five linemen, who they thought were their best five linemen on the field, and he as much admitted he didn't think Myers was ready yet. So, um, you know, Myers is a second-year player, a redshirt freshman. So, you know, um, that's fine. Usually, you know, you don't, expect an offensive lineman to play a whole lot his first or second year, although Myers was a quote-unquote blue-chip uh, type prospect. Uh, Michael Jordan has been the rarity you know, at Ohio State to come in and play from the first game as a starter two years ago. So, um, you, you know, I honestly, and we've had these internal debates among our own staff, and some of us are of a mind that it is uh, – poor play by the offensive line. I'm more of a belief that this is a really poor scheme that they're being asked to ask, execute. This is the intersection of everything we thought it was going to be, what Urban Meyer wants the offense to be versus what Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson want it to be, and, and it's a dysfunctional mess other than the 420 yards they get uh, throwing every week. <laughs> They, uh, they can't score in the red zone, and they can't get two yards when they need two yards running the football. And other than that, boy, they can really throw the heck out of it. So, um, you know, the bottom line was it wasn't good enough to win the last game they played. And against a Purdue defense that, you know, no one's going to put in Canton. So, you know, I think that <laughs> these guys got some issues that they need to work through. And, I, you know, people say, oh, the offensive line isn't physical enough. They're not nasty enough. Um, you know, that's fine. I mean, they're great pass protecting. You don't see Haskins go down very often. He usually has a, has a pretty clean pocket to work out of, and he's done pretty well with that. Uh, maybe run blocking isn't their forte. I don't know. But these run pass options kind of limit uh, some of their aggressiveness, I think. You don't see these guys – uh, you know, turn somebody loose on the back side uh, and go pinpoint a linebacker, you know. I mean, because if you're running to the left side, you don't necessarily need to block the, the right side defensive end. You can go find somebody in the second level to help spring your guy. Well, these run pass options, you've got to keep a pocket. You can't go downfield. If you go downfield, you're going to get flagged for an eligible uh, 
receiver downfield. So, you know, I think it's complicated. Uh, I don't like a one-back set where the quarterback isn't isn't a runner because basically now your running back is naked and has does not have a protector. Uh, and the protector, in the sense that the quarterback could keep the ball and run it, uh, kind of kind of made people hesitate a little bit. Uh, now the linebacker, the middle linebacker, can key the running back and meet him at whatever hole he chooses to go to and hold him up till other people get there. We don't see Weber and Dobbins running through any arm tackles. They're not making anybody miss. They're getting hit at the line of scrimmage. So, yeah, the whole thing's a mess, Dave, in my opinion. Um, it's just, you know, if this is how you're going to play, you need to uh, work uh, the exterior a little bit, and we never see any run plays going to the outside, very rarely. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, and, of course, Ryan Day will say, well, you know, it's a designed run or whatever, but if he decides to throw it, that little six-yard toss out to Paris Campbell should really be considered part of the run game and whatever. And Okay, then when it's uh, – Fourth and goal at the four-yard line, and you need, uh, or fourth and two, and you need two yards. You know, show me the, show me where you're converting those. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of my feeling on the whole thing. Is it's, it's just a dysfunctional mess. Yeah, very well said. We're all, you know, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of it. A lot of people are guilty of, you know, just looking at. I guess I don't just look at the players. I've, I've talked a lot about how. You know, Stud, while I love interviewing him, he'd be a great guy to have a beer with. You know, Ed Warner is much better offensive line coach. Ed Warner was over his head as an offensive coordinator. But, yeah, and the scheme is not really conducive to offensive linemen who just want to get after it. So it's not just the players underperforming, which I think there is some of that. It is, it is the scheme. That was very well said, Steve. All right, let me, let me leave you with this very deep question, but it has to be asked. I mean, looking at Urban Meyer's health situation, he felt the need to, you know, gather a couple reporters and, and talk about it yesterday. His doctor even talked to uh, Pete Thamel from Yahoo about it. So I guess just what do you make of Urban Meyer's comments yesterday about his health? Do you feel better or worse about his future at Ohio State after hearing from Meyer and from his doctor? Well, there were some comments that he made that were somewhat troubling or puzzling, and I think one of them was – He's getting questions whether he's upset at the administration or something, and, and he said something to the effect of, that has nothing to do with this. And, and, you know, he has debunked some of that administrative thing, apparently, where at least where Gene Smith is concerned, uh, maybe not, he has not talked a whole lot about the president, uh, 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 Michael Drake, a whole lot in this whole episode, and maybe how he was left... Uh, hung out to dry on this whole thing, but in some ways that's all water under the bridge at this point. That was a month and a half or, you know, two months ago, whatever. But uh, at any rate, uh, that to me was was somewhat uh, interesting that he didn't necessarily debunk the notion that there is something afoot with that, but he said that this is an entirely separate issue, that he is continuing to have headaches, <clears throat> apparently stemming from this arachnoid cyst that is on his head that may be creating some pressure. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not a neurologist, so I can't explain it other than he is definitely having some issues, as it's been pointed out, uh, with collapsing on the sideline, uh, holding his head at various times, his demeanor. He seems like he's always in pain uh, or, or in a pained uh, sense. And does that limit his effectiveness as a coach, either preparing the team during the week or during the game day? I mean, we saw, and I don't want to say it's anywhere near as severe on the same level as what Jerry Kill was going through, but he was having seizures on the sideline and eventually uh, had to leave his position as the head coach at, the, at Minnesota because of it. And, I, again, I, it, it's premature to say that uh, Urban Meyer is going to be uh, forced to uh, re resign or retire because of this, but uh, you just wonder if uh, they they come up with some way to treat this, if he may at some point take a leave of absence. And, uh, you know, he's surrounded himself with a veteran staff of coaches who can basically carry the ball forward for him if that day comes. And so 
Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be in his best interest maybe after the bowl game or whatever the situation is. People are all upset about recruiting, and, you know, again, I don't ever let one class or one kid, uh, you know, color my thoughts on recruiting. If they don't happen to get Zach Harrison, you know, I'm going to be upset about it for about five minutes, and then, you know, I'm going to move on with the rest of my life because, you know, one guy doesn't stop the train from moving forward. So um, is it a trend? Is it indicative of, of a down period of Ohio State football coming? Well, I don't know that one class or one guy can tell us that, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, we have to take the coach at his word and just assume that he and his doctors are going to find the best way that they can to treat this and keep him going forward. It sounds like he is desperate to continue in this job and uh, believes that, uh, you know, this is what he wants to do and what he should be doing, and I know that's what Ohio State fans want uh, for him to, to be the, the guy that puts him back in the, in the playoff and, uh, you know, in contention for another championship. So uh, one day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's kind of where we're at right now. And, uh, you know, hopefully he's feeling better and hopefully the team will continue to play better as they go down the stretch. Great insights from Steve Hellwagon. Really appreciate it, Steve. And thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning in to the show. I appreciate that as well. Hope everyone has a great day. Happy Halloween, Bucknutters. Nutters.